Hello, I'm Nick Offerman, white male translator for Gaslit Nation. To sum up this week's episode, kleptocracy anywhere is kleptocracy everywhere. And this is a transnational crime syndicate masquerading as a government. Thanks for listening. Writing Trump's history is a bizarre exercise in parsing layers of propaganda. There is the propaganda written in real time by Trump's press lackeys, sometimes with anonymous quotes that were later revealed to be from Trump himself, often made under the alias John Barron. A real John Barron was the author of a 1974 best-selling book about the KGB. There is the investigative journalism written in real time on Trump's nefarious financial affairs by journalists who mostly have since died. And there is the media more when investigative journalists from Trump's past were censored, threatened, or generally kept out of the news, while journalists of Trump's present ignored blatant crimes in favor of an obsessive focus on Hillary Clinton's emails, a misalignment of priorities that was stoked by the FBI itself. I remember in 2016 thinking that this parsing of spectacle and propaganda and searching for documentation of the obvious is, ironically, the exact exercise I had to perform as a doctoral student examining materials from the former Soviet Union. It doesn't feel ironic anymore. American and former Soviet operatives are a linked entity, and prestigious institutions manufacture history in a way that would make George Orwell shudder and Roy Cohn proud. In 2017, the New York Times published an article insinuating that Trump and Manafort had no real relationship until 2016, when Manafort fortuitously appeared in the Trump Tower elevator to charm him, like characters in a rom-com from hell. The article did not mention that Manafort had known Trump since the 1980s, had lived in Trump Tower since 2006, and was linked to Trump through Cone, Stone, and a mafia syndicate intertwined with the Kremlin. To grasp why a Pulitzer Prize-winning paper would cover up that story, an accurate and far more interesting story, in favor of bland falsehoods, is key to understanding how Trump operates. Trump spent 2016 incriminating himself by doing things like asking Russia for Hillary Clinton's emails at a press conference or getting sued for child rape by a woman who claimed to be a victim of a global trafficking network. But still, most of the press did not bite, writing fawning portraits despite the enticement of Trump checking every box of classic tabloid fodder. Mafia ties, sex crimes, spies, secret meetings with global elites. Any one of these stories would be ratings gold. When the press works against its own financial interest, as it did by rejecting the harrowing truth of Trump, there is a deeper problem. As described throughout this book, the tactics Cohn devised to tame the press worked all too well. Roy Cohn died of complications from AIDS in 1986. Trump, true to form, abandoned Cohn when he fell ill, prompting Cohn to proclaim in an interview with Barrett that Trump pisses ice water. Cohn, true to form, died after being disbarred for dishonesty, fraud, deceit, and misrepresentation, and being convicted of fraud, fulfilling his dream of dying while owing the U.S. government vast amounts of money. He was fated at his funeral by the New York and D.C. celebrities who had legitimized him much in the way future New York and D.C. celebrities would legitimize his protege, Trump. They didn't talk about the mafia ties, about the shakedowns, about the political persecution, about the pain Cone caused his country. He was one of them, of their social class, so he had to be soft-pedaled to the status of lovable goon, much as Roger Stone would go on to be called a dirty trickster, or Trump would be embraced as a tabloid amusement. 
Before Cohn passed, he managed to teach Trump three key skills, how to swindle money, how to get married for maximum benefit, and, though the purpose behind this agenda was never publicly revealed, how to cozy up to America's enemies, the greatest one at that time being the Soviets. But most of all, he taught Trump how to construct a new American reality out of the wreckage of the American dream. Thank you for listening to this clip provided to you by Macmillan Audio. To hear more, look for this title wherever audiobooks are sold. I'm Sarah Kenzier, the author of The View from Flyover Country and my new book, Hiding in Plain Sight, which came out last week and is available for sale now. I'm Andrea Chalupa, a journalist and filmmaker and the writer and producer of the upcoming journalistic thriller, Mr. Jones. And this is Gaslit Nation, a podcast covering corruption in the Trump administration, rising autocracy around the world, and a global pandemic. So we are in week like 1000 of uh, covering the pandemic from quarantine. All of our worst fears have come to pass. I believe many of yours have as well. So welcome to our nightmare. I think you're not going to like it. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to have you. Welcome to our nightmare. It's great to have you. That's the next Gaslit Nation album. Yes, yes. It's like Alice Cooper, but in a positive way, uplifting. It's, it's enlightening and entertaining. Anyway, uh, Andre and I are like losing our, our shit. Just, it's, it's just too much. So we're just going to, you know, lose it further by going right into the horrific new coronavirus dream team that was announced yesterday. Um, This is euphemistically called the Council to Reopen America. And if you are a Gaslit Nation listener, you will recall that for about two years of episodes, going back to 2018, we have laid out who we believe are the most dangerous members of the administration. And they are the ones that have outlasted the constant purges of this revolving door autocracy. We have asked you time and time again to think, why are these people viewed as so indispensable? Why are they still around for so long? What kind of plans might they have in store? Well, now we know. In March, we laid out how some of that inner sanctum of corrupt and criminal elements often linked by nepotism, had been put in charge of the coronavirus response. At the time, this included Jared Kushner, Stephen Miller, Stephen Miller's new bride, Katie Miller, who also works for the Trump administration, Steve Mnuchin, and Mike Pence. On Monday, Trump announced the new committee, and now these are the people on the Council to Reopen America. We have... Jared, and now joined uh, with Jared, of course, is Ivanka. We have Wilbur Ross. We have Steve Mnuchin. And then uh, some new faces in the crowd, Larry Kudlow, Mark Meadows, and Robert Lighthizer, who I had to look up. Somebody wrote on Twitter that he's like the Jeff Lynn of the traveling Wilburys uh, to this uh, little cabal. And that is true. Um, So Robert Lighthizer. But we will fill you in on who this asshole is. As we've been saying for a long time, Jared and Ivanka have been essentially looming within the Trump administration as a kind of shadow government. They exert far more control than is generally noted or acknowledged by the mainstream media who tend to write about them in these kind of court intrigue pieces. They seek to build a dynastic kleptocracy. We have been warning you for years that the ultimate goal uh, is President Ivanka. Andrea, you said you had some thoughts on this. So before I get into everybody else, let's hear what you have to say on that. I got a rant. Yeah. Well, it's just plain as day that the plan is for Trump to stay in power, to steal the next election, to carry out his next term where he can pack the courts with even more far right judges handpicked for him by the far right Federalist Society, which overwhelmingly is against a woman's right to choose and against LGBT rights largely and so forth. And maybe Trump might even finally get that third term he's been teasing us about. (laughs) So, and after he's done, it's going to be his favorite child, his mini-me, Ivanka. That is the plan. That is why they've gobbled up the Republican Party. It's now the party of Trump. 
and the government is now the government of Trump. They're leaving their brand of corruption deep inside, purging, surrounding themselves with lackeys, loyalists, all of it. That's the name of the game. They're carrying it out, as Sarah's book says, in plain sight. So on a recent call with business leaders, just to give, a, give an example of how dictatorship works, dictatorship 101, on a recent call with business leaders, Trump claimed Ivanka created 10% of all jobs in the United States. This is known as the big lie, a lie so colossal and brazen that how dare you even challenge it? It's just so absurd. But repeated often enough, it becomes part of the mythology of the dictatorship. And this is all according to a famous psychological profile of Adolf Hitler from a 1943 book. And I'm quoting this book now. Never admit a fault or wrong. Never to accept blame. Concentrate on one enemy at a time. Blame that enemy for everything that goes wrong. Take advantage of every opportunity to raise a political whirlwind. That is what Trump does. That is what he's known for doing. It, it, he, According to his ex-wife, Ivana Trump, Trump studied the speeches of Hitler. Trump studied Hitler. That is why we're seeing right in front of us before our eyes, Trump in his Hitler cosplay. Believe your eyes, believe your ears, okay? Don't allow anyone to normalize any of this. And of course, one of the enemies that Trump likes to create his feuds with and scapegoat is the press. You know, according to Leslie Stahl of 60 Minutes, she pressed him on this. Like, why do you keep attacking the press? It's so, it, it get over it already. You've made your point. You know, why are you doing it constantly? And Trump told her that, you know, he does it to demean you and discredit you so no one will believe negative stories about him. Obviously, and it's the dictator handbook. Um, so let's listen to this wannabe dictator falsely claiming another big lie that he has total authority. Here's CNN's Katie Collins taking on an aspiring dictator. This is how it's done. A quick question about something you just said. You said when someone is president of the United States, their authority is total. That is not true. Who, who okay, told you? you know what we're going to do? We're going to write up papers on this. It's not going to be necessary because the governors need us one way or the other because ultimately it comes with the federal government. That being said, we're getting along very well with the governors, and I feel very certain that uh, there won't be a problem. Has yeah, please, governor, go ahead. Has any governor agreed that you have the authority to decide when their state I haven't asked up? anybody. Because I no don't, you know why? Because I don't have to. Go ahead, please. But who told you the president has the total authority? Enough. And then at, at another coronavirus Trump rally, here is Trump beating up on one of his favorite scapegoats, the press, Paula Reed of CBS News in turn teaches a master class on journalism. The argument is that you bought yourself some time, you didn't use it to prepare hospitals, you didn't use it to ramp up testing. Let me just, listen, I just went over it. I just went over it. In an unprecedented crisis. Nobody thought we should do it. And when I did it. But what did you do with the time that you bought? You know the we month did? of February. That, you know what we did? Gap. What do you do? What do you do when you have no case in the whole United States? You had cases when in you, you excuse me, you reported it. Zero cases, zero deaths on January 17th. January. February, the entire January. Month of February. I said in January. Your video has a complete gap. On month January 30th. What did your administration do in February with the time that your travel ban bought? A lot. A lot. And in fact, we'll give you a list. What we did, in fact, part of it was up there. It we did a lot. A look, look, you know you're a fake. You know that your whole network, the way you cover it, is fake. Simply put, this little blood money brigade that Trump's put together, it's just an extension of how dictatorship works. Dictatorships are essentially a mafia state. It's organized crime where they brutally consolidate power. They purge. Now is the time where they're cashing in more than ever before. No, I agree. And, you know, while I'm glad that those reporters finally confronted Trump in real time, what should be happening, and I can't stress this enough, is that these 
press conferences, these rallies, these Trump propaganda rallies that are disguised as press conferences should not be aired at all. They should not be aired live. If something absolutely essential happens, like some sort of public safety or public health information is delivered by an actual reputable source and we need to know it, then cut that little clip out and air it later. Because all you are doing is acting like a bunch of Botoxed reef installs just putting out this horrific propaganda, as Andrea accurately calls it, this Hitler cosplay into the world. And, you know, networks, you have a choice. You have a choice of whether to do the right thing at an absolute seminal moment in our history. Trump thrives on this. This is his oxygen. If you cut this off, it is beneficial for our country and our safety, and it, it hurts him. This is something that actually does take away his power. But anyway, back to the crime cabal. <laughs> so along with Jared and Ivanka, we have Steve Mnuchin and Wilbur Ross. Um, many episodes ago, I brought up how they all come from the same little New York City uh, Wall Street shakedown cabal. These are people who've been tied to corporate raiders like Carl Icahn, who himself was part of the Trump administration, and who actually selected Ross and Mnuchin. This is Carl Icahn's idea. He installed them into this administration. And Icahn was investigated by Robert Mueller in late 2017 and actually had to resign. There actually seemed to be some pushback. It was one of the brief moments I, of hope I had during that entire probe. Nothing, of course, ever came of it uh, because we're talking about Robert Mueller, um, the most ineffective prosecutor of all time. Anyway, uh, Mnuchin also was tied to the Bernie Madoff Ponzi scheme. He's one of the few people who made money off of that. And, you know, we've discussed this in many episodes. But what's important to remember, of course, is, you know, well, what is Mnuchin's job? He's the treasurer and Wilbur Ross is the secretary of commerce. The Treasury was hijacked by Russia in 2015. BuzzFeed has written numerous exposés about this. It was never resolved. The whistleblower was the only person punished. And so any action that has to do with Mnuchin and coronavirus and bailout money and all of these other issues is actually a Trump-Russia issue. It's actually a Trump transnational crime issue. And we should look at the oligarchs and other beneficiaries who are working in in the shadows uh, trying to benefit off that. And so uh, for the lesser known members of this little crime cult, we've got Larry Kudlow, uh, who I guess is not lesser known because he's uh, on television lying all the time. Technically, his job is the director of the U.S. Economic Council. He is yet another financial crime lord from the 80s, another Reagan throwback, who had worked with trickle-down economics czar Art Laffer, uh, who himself has also returned <laughs> to help guide this process. So, you know, we've always noted on this show how many of the people in the Trump administration are just the culmination of long-term Republican strategies divided in the early 80s. You see this with Paul Manafort, with Roger Stone, and with all of these individuals who basically, as Reagan famously said, you know, they want to drown government in a bathtub. They want to destroy the federal government from within. But now, of course, it's uh, linked to transnational organized crime, to mafia operations that are tied to the Kremlin, but that extend worldwide. It's more complicated than a sort of all-American rugged individualism. You know, that's the packaging, but it's actually a global affair and digital media has increased that even more. Kudlow said of the coronavirus back in February, we have contained this. I won't say airtight, but pretty close to airtight. There are now over 20,000 people dead in the United States with no sign uh, that we have peaked yet. You know, I saw a thread the other day and they were like, when did you know that the coronavirus was going to change American life as we knew it forever? And they said, when Larry Kudlow said it was airtight, I knew we were fucked. And I'm like, yeah, I mean, we, we knew before that we were watching the videos out of Wuhan, but that's a pretty good indicator. And so then you have Mark Meadows. And you might be like, who the fuck is Mark Meadows? And Mark Meadows is Trump's chief of staff. And the reason you may have forgotten that is because Trump goes through chiefs of staff like they're Spinal Tap drummers. 
Other fun facts about Mark Meadows, he was a key proponent of the Jerusalem Embassy move uh, funded by Sheldon Adelson. Sheldon Adelson is the primary donor uh, to the Republican Party. He is someone who is upholding this whole Trump administration, and he's been very quiet over the last couple of months. I've kind of wondered what he's up to. Notably, um, nearly everybody on the Council for, God, what the fuck did they call it? Oh, to reopen America. Yes. The Council to Reopen America was involved in this um, Sheldon Adelson branded Jerusalem embassy move. So that's interesting considering so many of them have nothing to do with Middle East policy uh, like Mnuchin, or at least it's not in their job description. Notably, like Mike Pompeo and Mike Pence, Mark Meadows is a rapture fiend who is basing policy around his belief that we are living in the end times. Meadows also uh, is a disaster proponent in general, uh, secular and otherwise, who helped cause the 2013 government shutdown. Recently, he has spent his time critiquing the Mueller probe and trying to shut that down and defending Trump's uh, 2019 shakedown of Ukraine. So he's on the council. He will be determining your economic livelihood and the livelihood of our nation. And then finally, we have Robert Lighteiser. I don't have a hell of a lot to say. Uh, Seems to be a fan of trade wars, likely part of the war on China propaganda effort where we see, you know, the administration labeling this, you know, the Chinese flu or or whatever the hell they're doing. Anyway, so all of these shitheads are are managing a plague. Do you have thoughts on that, Andrea? Look, the Republican Party has always been united in their sense of corruption, of deregulation, of breaking unions, unions that allowed people to not just make a living wage, but to actually thrive in America. And they've crushed the unions in America, just like they're destroying the environment, which leads to a, a, a you know decline in species and so forth. So the Republican Party is so united compared to the Democrats, as we're seeing the big tent, the Democratic Party, because the Republicans, first and foremost, rally around blood money. These are the ideological heirs of the same people who are on the side of the Confederacy, who thought that human beings should be raised like cattle, that families should be broken apart, that people could be raped, children could be raped, because they were owned. They were owned. So we're still fighting the Confederacy. And slavery itself has transformed into the largest prison population in the world, in in the United States. And you have guys like John Kelly and others benefiting from not just the private prison and mili- you know, industrial complex, but also the prison camps for asylum seekers that are on the border that are destroying families, destroying children, trafficking innocent people. The Republican Party has always been the safe refuge for the movement that built America, that helped build America, that's always profited and fought to protect with deep pockets blood money blood money, blood money. And, you know, you saw it with Bush's illegal wars, his, his illegal invasions built on lies, Afghanistan, Iraq, that were still stuck in, that unleashed a Pandora's box, that gave birth to ISIS and so forth. And so it's no surprise that you have a very blatant extension of this led by Ivanka and Jared Kushner, who are friends with a mass murdering dictatorship, you know, the Saudi regime, and and including its murdering prince, MBS, who killed an an incredible writer, Jamal Khashoggi, while his fiance waited in the car. These guys are profiteering right before our eyes. There's so many examples of this. And and I want to quote David Begno of CBS, citing his colleague, Weijia Jiang, and pointing out how Trump is once again, like, putting profit over people's lives. So David writes on Twitter, adding to what Ouija is reporting below, a FEMA spokesperson told me, this is not the way we usually do it. FEMA usually gives to the state directly. Now 50% of what FEMA is flying in from overseas goes to private companies, which sell it to states that offer the highest dollar. What he's talking about, just to clarify, because I didn't before, is that FEMA was bringing in all these shipments of much needed protective gear to keep our medical workers on the front lines who are working tireless hours, who are separated from their families, who are getting sick and dying themselves. So all these much needed supplies that Jared and Ivanka and Trump's White House are flying in through FEMA, all those much needed supplies, 50% of them are going to the states and then the remaining 50 are being fought over 
from the states and being sold to the highest bidder through private companies, through private companies. And those private companies are then profiteering off of this blood money. Now, who are those private companies? Well, there's a really interesting story in Politico showing how this guy named Mike Gula went from being a big time, big time GOP fundraiser to suddenly having a massive change of heart and going into the business of providing much needed protective gear like masks and other things to medical workers, the states that are that poorly, desperately need them. Um, here's Alex Instadat of Politico's pointing out on Twitter, hard to overstate just how big a deal Mike Gula was in GOP fundraising circles. Now he's running an enterprise being billed as one of the largest producers of Corona supplies. And it could be the kind of activity that catches the eye of investigators. Why would it catch the eye of investigators when he's a GOP fundraiser? He's one of them. What I'm saying is, you know, the reporting is pointing to the fact that Trump's inner circle, the guys that are helping them consolidate, seize, and stay in power, they're making blood money hand over fist right now. The only jobs Ivanka Trump is creating, as before our very eyes, are blood money jobs. The, 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 she's enriching guys like Mike Gula. No, absolutely. And it's, you know, it's grotesque on its own level. We're also seeing things like the governors that had been forced to basically be game show style for necessary medical supplies, for uh, personal protective equipment. They're now forming their own alliances, you know, to try to keep the circulation of those medical materials flowing between them. Um, and that, of course, is tapping into the fantasies of the Republican Party and particularly of the Kremlin for a breakdown of the United States, a dissolution of the United States, uh, you know, the hardening of these, quote, red and blue lines into something that's real. And I don't think that that's certainly the intent of the governors, uh, you know, that are participating in this, although I do wish that Gavin Newsom would stop referring to California as a nation state, like perhaps he's unaware, but that's literally the term that neo-Confederates and Alexit Kremlin operations have been using to describe it. This is a time where we need to stick together as America because what Trump and his lackeys are doing, what the Republican Party wants to do, is strip this country down and sell it for parts. And a broken down country is a lot easier to manage. A country of terrified people, 30% of whom are now unemployed, are easier to manage. And eventually, the fear that we're all facing turns to scapegoating turns to panic, turns to blame, and it leads to a lot of simplifications about, you know, what kind of state is, you know, has what kind of governance and so forth. You know, I know I mentioned this time and time again, but it's because it's the reality of my life. Like, I live in a blue city, quote unquote, that's in a red, quote unquote, state. And, you know, I can go right across the river to Illinois and be in a blue state. And historically, you know, that's a significant thing for a Missourian to do. That is what slaves from Missouri had to do. That's what abolitionists from Missouri had to do all throughout the 19th century. I do not want to be uh, in a position where our country is so fractured that these are the kind of comparisons that I'm thinking in my mind. And I think that one of the reasons that this fracturing is starting to stick and that I'm seeing a lot of very angry, you know, well, go ahead, you know, go and secede, like we don't need them, you know, with this assumption that somehow the quote unquote red states are entirely filled of, you know, MAGA hat wearing neo-Confederates, where in, you know, reality, most of these blue dots or blue areas are heavily black areas. You know, you certainly see that in Louisiana and Alabama. You see it in St. Louis and you see it in, you know, the former cities of the Rust Belt in, in places like St. Louis or Kansas City um, or Cleveland. Like it's, it's not so simple. But I think what's missing, and this just crushes me, is there's no national mourning. There's no national grief. You know, we're all feeling it. I really, I think everyone is. It doesn't matter who you voted for or what your political views are. We're all feeling the intensity of the sadness, the fright, the fear for the future, and the loss. You know, most people, they know someone who's had coronavirus, or they know someone who, who has died from it, or they know someone who knows somebody. It affects all of us. But do you see, you know, the flag at half staff? Like in some states, yes. In some cities, 
Yes, but do we see it nationally? You know, I mean, it's abnormal. Like it should be at half staff. And I know that that's a symbolic gesture, like in that what's needed above all, of course, is protective equipment, is a raise for all of our medical workers and our service workers. They need hazard pay. They need a raise that will endure beyond this tragedy. Like there are more concrete things to do besides lower the flag in a symbolic gesture, but they also need to do that. You know, we need days of mourning. When we have mass shootings, like even if it's in one location, they will lower that flag. You know, I'm known for taking these big cross country road trips. And one of the things that's always saddened me over the last couple decades is how often the flag is at half staff, no matter where I am, because there's always some sort of horrific tragedy going on. But this is, you know, one of the most just devastating and destructive tragedies of our lifetime. And there isn't this sense of national unified mourning and grief and appreciation for our medical workers who are risking their lives, our service workers who are risking their lives, postal workers, everyone who can't just stay home, who has to go out and also honestly pay some tribute for everyone who is staying home, who is often losing their job as a consequence, losing their livelihood, psychologically suffering. Like we have PTSD from this as a nation, you know, as a world, it's a lot to take in. And I see sort of national, you know, movements, symbolic things in China and Italy. And then here you just have it all as Trump. It only is about Trump because it can't be anything else. Everything has to revolve around him and his emotional state and his family and their crime and their th- theft. And they're, you know, taking this moment of incredible vulnerability for all of us and exploiting it so blatantly, so cruelly, and with so little pushback. Like, if this isn't the time to call this shit out, whether at a press conference or in Congress, then when is it? Like, we the people cannot take to the streets right now. We could hurt each other. We would be, you know, virus vectors trying to change this administration. But Congress can do things. Things, and instead they take a vacation. Like I I don't understand it. I don't understand the lack of pragmatic action. And, and I'm excluding, of course, the people who are trying. And I, you know, mayors are trying, governors are trying, and a great appreciation for that. Many others are not trying, and they're not calling out in plain terms just how criminal this is. They're kind of shrugging it off, like, oh, that's Trump. It's just Trump being Trump again. It's like, yeah, he's a fucking dictator and a criminal. And you've known that the entire time. Like you have to stop using your feigned shock as a mask for your inaction. That is what's happening. Like they pretend that they were born yesterday and they couldn't possibly foresee these circumstances, even though Trump and his cronies announced them all in advance, even though in many ways, this is the continuum of a Republican plot, an organized crime plot, a Kremlin plot, a white supremacist plot, and so many others that are using this as a vector. And I'm just, uh, I'll stop because I'm just, I'm so disgusted that I could go on forever, Um, but I want to hear you talk. Yeah, no, I'm I'm furious. And, and there's certain places I can't allow my mind to go because I will just have a breakdown over just how criminal this is and how negligent the people that could have stopped it and didn't stop it. The Trump crime family stole this election in the first place. Paul Manafort is in prison for helping them engineer that strategy. Paul Manafort promised that he could deliver, and he did. And he broke his silence days before the 2016 election bragging on how those swing states were going to turn to Trump at the last minute, states that Hillary was supposed to have securely for herself. And we saw that Michigan, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, they stole the election and we let them steal the election and no one stopped it when they could. And now here we are. Here we are. There is no other outcome for that disastrous decision of not stopping them than we could than the fact that we have a full-blown dictatorship Um, picking up speed in the White House, driven by Trump himself, who has studied for this moment. He has studied for this moment. And Ivanka and Jared are lockstep with them. The three of them are the unholy trinity. They are the de facto president of the United States. This is all playing out before our eyes. And they're profiting. They're profiting off of killing people, off of depriving states that need it most, life-saving, life-saving supplies. That is what's happening right now because we didn't stop them when we had the chance. 
let's break it down some more in how uh, Trump and his loyalists, their um, inner sanctum of the blood money brigade, how they're profiting off of this. So there's been um, a lot of talk about this hydroxychloroquine, <laughs> this malaria drug, this drug that's used by people who suffer from lupus and other ailments. There's been chatter out of France from a dubious doctor out of France that it might help with COVID-19. So the FDA fast-tracked approval for states to test it. There's been no signs that it has any positive results. Yet Trump in his coronavirus Trump rallies has been pushing it. And lo and behold, it turns out that he has a small stake in a company that sells this stuff. That's no surprise there. But of course, reporters have pointed out that it's such a small stake, so it's, it doesn't really seem like he'd be doing it for financial reasons. But don't forget, this is Donald Trump. He one time cashed a check for 13 cents, sent to him from Spy Magazine. So anything that's good for business, no matter how small, is good for Trump. He puts his own interests first all the time. Business Insider points out how the rest of Trump's circle has a stake in this drug. I'm going to read now from Business Insider. Others within Trump's circle also have ties to Sanofi, the company that makes this drug. According to the Times, the Times reported that one of Sanofi's largest shareholders is Fisher Asset Management, a fund set up by political donor Ken Fisher, who has a history of donations to the GOP and contributed to Trump's 2016 campaign, according to NBC. However, a representative for Fisher Investments in an emailed statement argued that the holding was not material in its size. The spokesman said the company represents less than 0.8% of Fisher Investments portfolio and the firm's ownership is less than 0.7% of Sanofi. Neither the firm nor Ken Fisher have ever promoted the drug described in the New York Times article in any way or discussed it with anyone, end quote. A 0.7% stake in Sanofi was, as of early April 8, worth around Seven hundred and seventy-five million. The spokesman also said that Fisher had donated to Democrats as well as Republicans. A fund previously run by Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross also invests in Sanofi, according to the report. Though Ross said in a statement that he was not aware of the company's involvement with Sanofi, nor was he personally involved in the decision to explore hydroxychloroquine as a treatment. And according to ProPublica. Employees who were formally compensated or employed by Sanofi went on to work at several federal agencies, including the Department of Health and Human Services, the Department of Justice, and the Office of Management and Budget. Despite the optimism surrounding chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine as potential COVID-19 treatments, the drugs can cause severe side effects and misuse has led to poisoning and even death. But who cares when the stock is up as and the stock did yeah. go up. And so this is a topic that has, as you just mentioned, you know, gotten some investigative journalism. People are taking a look at it. You know, and I've been asked my opinion on it several times. And it's like, yes, of course, Trump and Kushner are trying to profit off death, trying to profit off of a crisis. This is what they do. Trump was immortalized by John Bolton as having participated in a metaphorical drug deal in Ukraine and is now involved in the actual drug deal. And while, of course, this is bad and under normal circumstances would be cause for impeachment hearings uh, and we would have a Congress that would actually commence with that. Here, you know, it's really the tip of the iceberg. I've said many times that Trump covers up crime with scandal, but he also covers up big crimes with small crimes. And so the small crime here, uh, which the media is endlessly scrutinizing, is the peddling of this snake oil uh, for a fleeting profit. But the big crime is the same crime that they've been engaged in all along, which is systematically stripping down America and selling it off for parts. That's been their goal since they entered the White House. This is a fundamentally anti-American administration. So, you know, I encourage people to investigate this case, but don't lose sight of the big picture. So guess what? In addition to this reality show of terror we're seeing play out that cable news is running by airing Trump's campaign rallies, which are supposed to be coronavirus updates to help bring the country together. So in addition to that reality show of terror, we also have Trump packing the courts across America and leaving a massive, massive monument to himself in how he's remaking America's judicial system. 
in his image, essentially. Let's break this down. If the coronavirus coverage isn't making you infuriated, I mean, listen to what he's doing to our courts. According to Vox, in less than three years as president, President Trump has done nearly as much to shape the courts as President Obama did in eight years. Trump hasn't simply given lots of lifetime appointments to lots of lawyers. He's filled the bench with some of the smartest and some of the most ideological, reliable men and women to be found in the conservative movement. Long after Trump leaves office, these judges will shape American law, pushing it further and further to the right, even if the voters soundly reject Trumpism in 2020. Let that sink in for a moment. On the courts of appeal, the final word in the overwhelming majority of federal cases, more than one quarter of active judges are Trump appointees. In less than three years, Trump has named a total of 50 judges to these courts, compared to 55 Obama appointed during his entire presidency. Before he became president, Trump promised to delegate the judicial selection process to the Federalist Society, a powerful group of conservative lawyers that counts at least four Supreme Court justices among its members. Quote, we're going to have great judges, conservative judges, all picked by the Federal Society, Trump told a radio show hosted by the right-wing site Breitbart while he was still a candidate. The Federalist Society spent decades preparing for this moment, and they've helped Trump identify many of the most talented, conservative stalwarts in the entire legal profession to place on the bench. Trump's nominees will serve for years or even decades after being appointed. Even if Democrats crush the 2020 elections and win majorities in both houses of Congress, these judges will have broad authority to sabotage the next president's agenda. There is simply no recent president for one single president having such a transformative impact on the courts. Trump has built a monument to himself in our judicial system, everyone, okay? That is what he's done here. If Imagine if he steals another election, or imagine if the left cannot unite, just like the left could not unite in the UK in their recent election. There's so much infighting, and that infighting helped the right in the UK. They helped the right consolidate power. It completely finalized a deal on Brexit. The infighting on the left in the UK's recent election did that. What if we have that here in the US? What if the left can't come together around Biden? What if those who wanted Bernie Sanders to be the next president, even if Bernie's endorsed Biden, even though Bernie and Biden are friends, what if the left can't come together again like they couldn't in 2016? Close elections are easy to steal. We need a landslide in 2020 and a lot of these key states to make it as hard as possible for Republicans to steal them. So if Trump manages to steal another election, Imagine what our courts are going to look like with another four years of Trump. As we're always saying in authoritarian regimes, the judicial system, they're the cage bars. They're the cage bars that trap any hope for democracy. If you look at Ukraine, for example, all those dozens of people that gave their lives in this rare popular uprising that actually succeeded, popular uprisings rarely managed to succeed. But in Ukraine, Euromaidan, the Revolution of Dignity, it succeeded. And it did so because dozens gave their lives in order to force Yanukovych off the throne. And then he fled to Russia. And the next president was pro-Western, pro-democracy, and he was overwhelmingly elected. But what happened was the fight against corruption that so many gave their lives for in Ukraine was completely hobbled by the judicial system in Ukraine. You had all these corrupt judges that were delaying and stopping much needed progress. And plus you had some corruption by that president that was elected who was an oligarch and he wasn't fulfilling his promises. He was doing some good stuff, but not enough. But the judicial system certainly helped corruption stay in place. Again, remember, the judicial system are the cage bars that lock in and confine any hope for democracy to flourish. And if Trump gets another four years, we could really slide into the black hole, the abyss of corruption. And it's going to take people sacrificing their lives in protests and uprisings like we saw in Ukraine, like we saw in Syria, like we saw in Venezuela. And remember, popular uprisings rarely succeed. 
Look at what those kids are doing in Hong Kong, how they're going out to protest and they have letters to their parents saying goodbye to them in their backpacks. So we don't want a generation like that where kids have to go out to protest not knowing if they'll ever see their parents again. We don't want to get to that point yet in America. And if we stop Trump, no matter what, you know, vote for Biden, no matter what, in November, if Bernie tells you to vote for Biden, you vote for Biden. If you do not, you are sentencing a generation to go out and risk killing themselves to try to turn all this back. We stand a fighting chance right now. If the progressive movement gets four more years of Trump, it's done. We've lost a generation. We've lost maybe two three generations. We don't know how long it'll take to reverse this. It's a black hole of corruption. You just keep sliding deeper into it. It's very difficult to climb back out. Yeah. And honestly, that's almost the optimistic view because with the ticking clock of climate change hovering above this and also the weaponization of things like coronavirus, like if they do things, for example, like a vaccine is brought forth, but it's not widely or equitably distributed where it becomes something only accessible to people with certain beliefs or accessible to people of certain incomes, to millionaires, billionaires, corporate elites, and so on. These are all hypothetical. Well, climate change is not hypothetical. That's a hypothetical scenario that I think a lot of people would listen to and think, well, that's impossible. That's so outrageously evil. That's so outrageously wrong. Uh, you know, Stop going down that road. Stop thinking those thoughts. That's often the reaction when we bring up something like that. And then what happens is it comes to pass in reality. And I'm not saying this is definitive. I'm not saying it's something that they're going to do. I'm saying it's definitely the kind of thing they are capable of doing. They are capable of doing so many horrific acts that what you've seen transpire so far will pale in comparison yeah. to what's coming. And to mm -hmm. be quite honest, Andrea and I hold back a lot. We have private conversations about what we imagine they'll do, given their background in things Things like trafficking, the multiple pedophiles that Trump has befriended, these dark, horrific networks that surround people like Jeffrey Epstein. This is the mafia. These are mafia states, and they are brutal and vicious and relentless, and they have no regard for the sanctity of human life. So there are a lot of places that this can go. Like If you think it's bad now, you have no idea what they're capable of. And we often don't go down that road because we have enough to deal with. With, with what we know for sure or what we can say with like 90% certainty we, we believe is coming. We try to stay in the realm of established possibility. If we go beyond that, I mean, it's evil. You're dealing with evil. And so, yes, you need to take every measure possible, every precaution to ward this off. And that doesn't mean you go around saying, you know, Joe Biden is amazing. It doesn't mean you get sucked into some sort of personality cult for anybody. You should absolutely critique Biden for things that he's done wrong. And you, you should try to improve his platform. And I think that Biden realizes that, especially on economic issues, he needs a more progressive platform. I think he's taking Bernie's advice to heart on that because with coronavirus, things like universal basic income, uh, dramatically raising the minimum wage for service workers, debt forgiveness, those are not just mainstream proposals. Those are desperately needed proposals to keep our economy afloat. And so however we come out of this, we will be a different country than before. And I think that Bernie Sanders recognizes that. And I think Joe Biden recognizes that. And I think the Democrats that are moving to form a strong coalition, one that's not conformist, one that still has variety and viewpoint, that's arguing about issues, that is healthy. That is a healthy democracy. And you see folks like AOC and Warren and you know so many other Democrats, they grasp this and they understand it and they're trying to do this right and they're trying to do it meaningfully. And I honestly think the majority of Sanders voters understand this as well. But I would say, you know, pay no attention to the Bernie or bust crowd because guess what, everybody? We're already at bust. We've been at bust a long time and you're going to go from like bust to hell. So maybe do your part to protect the most vulnerable people in America because if you're already hit hard now, what you're you're going to be subject to is so much worse. So vote for someone other than yourself. Vote for other people's well-being and try to evaluate it morally on those grounds. You know, you have to ask yourself, are you willing to help someone you don't know? And if the answer is yes, then the solution is following Bernie's lead and voting for Biden and working together in the big, loud tent of the Democratic Party to get 
these progressive policies pass that we desperately need. And the temperature is right to finally get there. We're going to play a little bit of a a clip from um, Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders recently coming together to address the pandemic and to show leadership, to show unity, to show Americans working together, to show everything that the Trump crime family refuses to show in their daily campaign rallies in the White House, which violate the Hatch Act. Trump just ran a campaign video showing how great he is. That violates the Hatch Act. His White House staffers worked on that. Who's going to hold him accountable? Who's going to hold you know those staffers accountable for breaking the law? We can't because the DOJ is Trump's own personal lawyer, his mafia lawyer. It's his Roy Cohn, his consulary. So there's that. So now for something different, here's Biden and Bernie coming together. And Bernie is explaining to all of us how big structural change is done. We got to deal with income and wealth inequality. We got to deal with a health care system that is broken in so many ways. Well, you mentioned the issue of climate change. Man, we don't have a choice there. Future of the planet determines, demands that we are bold in transforming our energy system. And as you've indicated, we can create millions of jobs doing that. So there's a lot of work to do. Let's go forward together and uh, in doing that. And I know you are the kind of guy who is going to be inclusive. You want to bring people in, even people who disagree with you. You want to hear what they have to say. We can argue it out. It's called democracy. You believe in democracy. So do I. Let's respect each other. Let's address the challenges we face right now and in the future. And in that regard, Joe, I very much look forward uh, to working with you. And I want to applaud Bernie Sanders. You know, people were critical of him for staying in the race as long as he did. But by staying in uh, through Wisconsin, Bernie supporters came out and they voted for a critically important uh, Supreme Court state race in Wisconsin, which uh, removed a far right judge and replaced him with Jill Karofsky, who ended up winning. Um, So we have here from the VDC, Dane County Judge Jill Karofsky's win for the 10 year term in Wisconsin reduces the conservative majority in the top court to four to three. The court is expected to decide a case that seeks to purge more than 200,000 people from Wisconsin's voter rolls. The issue is sensitive in a state where presidential elections have been decided by fewer than 30,000 votes. That's what was at stake in, in the Wisconsin primary. And so Bernie stayed on the ballot through Wisconsin. And then the next day he dropped out of the race. And by being on the ballot, one could argue easily that that helped Karofsky come, you know, win that challenge. So that's what we have to do little by little. We need to take back our country through races like this. If we stay on this path, you know, in 10 years, we could be living in a strong, stable democracy with progressives in the White House. This is how it's done. Anybody who wants to burn it all down, thinking that there's a path, there's an alternative option of all of us building barricades and sacrificing our lives that option isn't reliable either. Look at Syria, look at Venezuela, look at Egypt. Egypt slid back after their uprising. So we're in trouble here. This is serious trouble. And so all of us have to unite or die as our friends at the How We Win podcast at Swing Left like to say, unite or die. Those are our only options ahead of us. Our discussion continues, and you can get access to that by signing up on our Patreon at the Truth Teller level or higher. We want to encourage you to donate to your local food bank, which is experiencing a spike in demand. We also encourage you to donate to Direct Relief at directrelief.org, which is supplying much-needed protective gear to first responders working on the front lines in the U.S., China, and other hard-hit parts of the world. We encourage you to donate to the International Rescue Committee, a humanitarian relief organization helping refugees from Syria and refugees who are some of the most vulnerable people in the world to this pandemic. Donate at rescue.org. And we also encourage you, as always, to help critically endangered orangutans already under pressure from the palm oil industry. Donate to the Orangutan Project at theorangutanproject.org. Gaslit Nation is produced by Sarah Kenzier and Andrea Chalupa. If you like what we do, leave us a review on iTunes. It helps us reach more listeners. And check out our Patreon. 
that keeps us going. Our production managers are Nicholas Torres and Carlin Daigle. Our episodes are edited by Nicholas Torres and our Patreon exclusive content is edited by Carlin Daigle. Original music in Gaslit Nation is produced by David Whitehead, Martin Vissenberg, Nick Farr, Damian Ariaga, and Carlin Daigle. Our logo design was donated to us by Hamish Smith of the New York-based firm Order. Thank you so much, Hamish. Gaslit Nation would like to thank our supporters at the producer level on Patreon. Adam Ingersoll. Adam Levine. Alabama. Alan Liu. Angela Harvey. Ann Marshall. Brian Tehuden. Carl Hozier. Carol Golstad. Katherine Anderson Karina. Kathy Cavanaugh. C. Baker. David Porter. Diana Gallagher. D.L. Singfield. Dorothy Kamarek. Doug Friedenberg, Elizabeth Dove, Eric Kaplan, Arena Guardia, Ethan Mann, Evan, Fontaine Carpenter, George Hughes, Gordon Shumway, <laughs> Gustav Halsby, Jared Lombardo, Jason Benke, Jason Rita, Jeff Thompson, Jennifer Slavic, Jens Eilstrup Rasmussen, Jans Eilstrup Rasmussen. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Joel Newman, John Laughlin, John Ripley, Karen Humphreys, Kate Cotton, Katie Musuris, Kelly Ranson, Kevin M. Garnett, Kim Mellon, Christy Vitale, Lawrence Graham, Leo Chalupa, who is safely quarantining. He's in quarantine. Very good. Where he belongs, indefinitely, until I say he can come out. Lindsay Eggleston, Lisa LaFlame, Lauren W. Todd, Luke Stranad, Mandy Farapore, Marcus J. Trent, Margaret Moe, Matt Perez, Maureen Murphy, Michael Stina, Michael Woodridge, Michelle Dash, Mike Tripico, Nicole Spear, Oliver Ash, Pamela Newport, Ray Alba, Rhonda White, Rich Craw, Robert Wojcinski, Sonia Bogdanovich, Solomon Hikes, Tanya Chalupa, also quarantined, <laughs> Tracy, Victoria Nordgren, Victoria Olson, Ren, Zachary Lemon. Thank you all so much for your support. We could not make the show without you.